going to ask Dr. Allen in a second about the new and novel combinations of targeted therapies, but maybe Dr. Burke, you can give us an, uh, maybe a, a, an idea of what your experience has been with venetoclax tolerability, safety. What are the things that you're thinking about when you're putting patients on venetoclax? What's been your experience um, with tolerability and, and safety? Yeah, I would, I, I would add a few, few comments. I think, you know, it, it's amazing as an oncologist when patients come in and tell you they have no side effects. And it's just, I hear a lot of that with venetoclax. I, I've used it quite a bit. And a lot of, I, I don't mean to say it has no side effects, but just to say that people come in, uh, you know, after six, nine, 12 months of therapy and they say, I, I feel fine, you know? So that's not everyone, but it's a lot of patients. So I really find it to be a well-tolerated well-tolerated drug. The issues I've had with patients um, are neutropenia, which, uh, and, and I, you know, in order to sort of try to maintain them on a full dose, I give a fair amount of growth factor, um, particularly during that first six months when they're on abinutuzumab. Um, uh, and then I've had one patient that I can recall where I just had to stop therapy because of Rhombocytopenia, where it, he just went into the teens, and I and I, you know, he di he didn't come out of it, and I think he's got some underlying liver disease that that caused that. So, that but rarely, you know, have I had to do that, and so I in general I think it's a very well tolerated drug, um, and I I found that giving GCSF really helps helps me maintain dose intensity without having to have too many pauses and uh, not too much. I think I've had to admit one patient with a neutropenic fever or something like that. So pretty rare to have to do that. Um, you know, and another comment about it is, um, you know, in the frontline setting, uh, you know, we, we uh, heard from Dr. Shaman that, that it's really, um, uh, you can debulk them with obinutuzumab and really get their tumor burden down. I've never had to admit a patient for for tumor lysis prevention in the frontline setting because I'm in, I'm in no rush to start it. You, I don't really feel the need to follow the label to start venetoclax on day 22 of cycle one all the time. You can give them a couple extra doses of obin if you need and debulk them a little bit further and make sure it's nice and safe, repeat a CT scan. And then, um, and, and you know, I've, had, I've been able to keep every patient as an outpatient. And doing that and following the label and, and really checking the tumor lysis labs on schedule on day two and on day three, it's been very safe and I've had, had really no problems with it, so. Great, so Dr. Allen, tell us a little bit about the combinations BTK inhibitor plus BCL2 inhibitor um, and what the interest is with and what the results have been uh, with those combinations. Yeah, so um, I should give credit to, to your center uh, for, for putting some of this data out there that kind of showed for the first time this preclinical synergy between BTK uh, inhibitors and BCL2 inhibitors. And so, um, you know, we are seeing um, this now translate to uh, clinical efficacy as well. And we are seeing kind of synergy and, and not just additive properties between these drugs, but that you know, we can really utilize uh, the, the modulation of different um, pathways um, uh, and, and then really hit them hard with both of these drugs. And so um, a lot of work has been done. There's been now a few clinical trials. I, I know Dr. Jane uh, from, from your center at MD Anderson has published some of the first uh, frontline data with, with combination uh, BCL2 uh, inhibitors, venetoclax and ibrutinib, and really showed for the first time uh, MRD rates that, uh, you know, rivaled, if not were better than, um, than, than what we used to see with chemoimmunotherapy, and especially in very high-risk patients. And so um, we, we are seeing that clinically. There's now has been transitioned to where the industry has, has started to turn out larger uh, phase studies with more and more patients, and now starting to introduce uh, MRD-based kind of thoughts and, and uh, response-adapted therapies versus just fixed durations. And so uh, one of the major studies that uh, uh, the viewers and, and uh, our, ourselves, and I know I'll be uh, keeping an eye out on, is, on on the updates, is this Captivate study, which is uh, um, a study by uh, 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 Pharmacyclics uh, looking at 
um, a combination of ibrutinib, venetoclax, and treatment naive, frontline patients, all comers basically. Uh, this study was is special in that um, it has two cohorts basically. Uh, the first cohort is an MRD response adapted cohort where uh, the patients get treated, they get debulked with ibrutinib for three months, and then treated with uh, an additional 12 months of venetoclax plus ibrutinib. So 15 months of combination or 12 months of combination, but 15 months total of treatment. And then at the end of that time in this very first cohort, MRD assessments are made in the bone marrow. And at uh, previous uh, congresses, we have, uh, uh, the groups have published uh, MRD rates in the bone marrow showing up to 72% of patients are MRD negative in the bone marrow just with the combination of ibrutinib and venetoclax. And, and let me remind you, there is no anti-CD20 in this, in this treatment regimen. This is all completely oral, which is really what makes it unique and special. And we're really seeing these impressive results. And so that study then ran, is randomizing the MRD negative patients. Of, uh, remember, there's 72% of over you know, 160 or 170 patients uh, were MRD negative, and they're randomized to placebo, double blind fashion, to placebo or continually maintenance ibrutinib. And so for the first time, we're going to really see, um, do we need maintenance? Is there a patient population that seems to benefit from maintenance? And so, um, you know, it's a unique uh, first time that we're kind of putting MRD into a response adapted thought to where we're just not measuring it, not knowing what to do with it. We're going to start to learn how, how what to do with it. The uh, groups that don't, so that 25% of patients that don't get to MRD uh, are being randomized to monotherapy ibrutinib versus continuing the doublet um, uh, and, and then some period of continual ibrutinib after that. And so that will be an interesting group to see who it is that's not getting MRD and then how well do they do. Also in that group, we'll be able to see, are they deepening over time? Because that is a big question uh, of how is MRD deepening over time? Right now, a lot of the data shows that you either kind of get there or you don't within the first year or two, and then, and then it doesn't seem to deepen. So there's something about the biology of the CLL that's kind of keeping it uh, uh, not from getting to that deep state. The study also has a fixed duration cohort that they opened a second cohort where they enrolled another, you know, several hundred, uh, 150 or 160, 170 patients to where they're just getting the same regimen and stopping irregardless of their uh, MRD status. And so, um, you know, they will be able to, because of the power of these two cohorts, be able to start to do some cross-study comparisons. And, and really, we're going to understand the value of, of stopping, uh, understand the value of continual maintenance therapy in these patients who do achieve it. And, and so I think there's a lot of power into the study. Now, there are many other studies that are looking at combinations of triplet and, and stopping therapies. And, I, you know, we can go through a whole list of them. So I think it's a really, uh, uh, there's a few studies by uh, the uh, cooperative groups. The Alliance has one in older patients uh, with a triplet with uh, obinutuzumab, ibrutinib, venetoclax versus just ibrutinib, obinutuzumab, uh, where those patients are going to have a response adapted therapy as well at the end of that combination therapy. There's an ECOG study as well, uh, E9161, which is for younger patients, less than 70. And uh, again, fixed duration uh, for the triplet regimen versus continual therapy of ibrutinib or benetuzumab. Now, uh, some of the arguments and maybe, you know, a downside of that is that there isn't a monotherapy ibrutinib arm or there isn't a, a fourth arm with, without an anti-CD20 plus the combination. So we, we're limited in terms of understanding the, uh, the benefit of that anti-CD20, whether or not that actually is going to help us or not. Um, but we'll start to see you know, MRD rates, and, and these are all very similar patient populations that will be able to make some comparisons across study to see if these MRD rates are any different, or can we have some added effect? Can we push people into the 80% bone marrow disease negative state with an anti-CD20 plus the doublet? So it's exciting times, and, and, and I think that's something that we're going to start to see over the next two or three years as the data continues to mature, and I think these studies really have an ability to impact uh, how we might treat patients into the future. And so I, I do think that right now we do these monotherapy kind of sequencing treatments, and, and, uh, but I do probably believe that um, in the future we will likely, just like we did with F, then adding FC, then adding FCR, in the future we will likely start to add all of our treatments, putting our best foot forward, getting the vast majority of people to MRD negative states, and then picking and choosing that high risk patient that we'll be able to leave on a continual maintenance therapy versus those low risk patients uh, that might be able to just get their 15 month stop and maybe go seven, six, 
seven, eight years, and then maybe just get that regimen again as a second treatment, again, for a fixed duration. And so, you know, over the course of 15 years, they may have two or three years of total treatment in that time. So I think that's where it's moving. So I think there's a lot of these questions that are up in the air that potentially may be moot and obsolete in, in a few years as and if we transition to, to combination therapies. And, and I'm not saying it's going to be right for every patient. There might be a patient who's elderly and frail because we have found additionally from, from these studies is that there does seem to be potentially some increased toxicities, nothing new, but things like diarrhea uh, might, might be a little bit more severe uh, with a combination therapy. Um, uh, there are some cytopenia issues that we start to deal with. So some of our frailer patients that are older that have low risk disease, they're in their late 70s or early 80s. They, they might just do beautifully with, an, uh, with a BTK inhibitor and never need another treatment in their lifetime. Uh, you know, so it's not going to be a one size fit all for sure, but definitely for our younger patients, for our, our more fit, our older patients, it's, a, it's an exciting opportunity for them to, to try to get almost every single patient to this MRD negative state, which we do believe is important, and especially if we're going to try to stop therapy. And so um, so that's where some of those combination data is coming around and what we have uh, uh, initially starting to come out. And like I said, some of these studies, and, and they're being done with a, a calibrutinib, uh, they're being done with uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors in combination with venetoclax. And, and, and as long as it's a B-cell receptor antagonist, PI3 or BTK, this synergy that you get with the BCL2 and modulation of that BCL2 family member protein population, um, you definitely uh, see this synergy along with these B-cell receptor antagonists. And so, um, you know, we're gonna have a lot of options for patients. We're gonna be able to tailor it. And uh, I do think uh, it's something to keep an eye out for, for how these studies mature and when they start to report out. Uh, definitely with PFS rates as, as we start to get three, four years out on some of these uh, uh, 